Hi and welcome back to Code Talk. We are having season two discussing relationships and I am really honored to have so many variety of guests to give insight and awareness so that we can have better relationships or maintain our relationships to be more fulfilling and happy. And I have with me a very special guest, Mr. Yannick Jacob. Hi, Mr. Yannick. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? I feel like I have to call you Mr. because you are my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, and I'm I just Yannick. I know, um, I, love, I know. I love uh, how Meng uh, from, uh, from Google, uh, he was the well-being guy at Google, like one of the first employees there. Okay, uh, yes. He always introduced his talks as, for those of you who know me, my name is Meng. For those of you who don't know <laughs> me, my name is still Meng. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's just because it's been years ago, but still, you know, from what I remember, you know, teaching me about existentialism and positive psychology has really opened up my mind. And even though I had it within me, but now you've got the language. And even though we have this awareness, when you have a deeper understanding, it really does open up your own values and you can see yourself a lot clearer. And also, before I forget, you've also written a couple of books which is amazing for people to read if they want to get into this a little bit further, Positive Psychology and Existentialism, right. which is an amazing um, sort of like openness and introduction mm -hmm. to what you would like to sort of get out of learning more about it. Right, so you can download these on my website. Uh, they're free. What is your website? Um, Existential.coach. Existential.coach. Because I'm the Existential Coach. Yes. I'm also a positive psychologist, hence yes. the book on positive psychology. Yeah. Uh, I was teaching uh, at the uh, Masters in Applied Positive Psychology and Coaching Psychology at the University of East London for some time. Right. And uh, that's where I really looked into how can the science of positive psychology add to the coaching process. Yes. But I've also looked into existentialism because I wanted to work with with clients across the spectrum of what they experience because sometimes we're already quite well and we want to yeah, be better exactly. sometimes we go through deep crisis or we go through times where life throws a lot of challenges at us you know we we get to a point where we have to make big important decisions that potentially affect us and the people around us for decades to come and that can really despair us sometimes we have big questions about why are we here and what does it mean to be human and how, how can I live authentically? How can I, you know, m like care about others, but also care about myself? Yes, there's, have there's that so balance. many things just because we are human beings. Of course. And that's what I wanted to uh, explore. And that's why I wanted to coach, you know, because I love having those conversations where mm -hmm. people are like, what shall I do? And so much of that comes from the relationships with other people, both romantically, but also at work or with family. That's true. So, this is why, why I wrote the book and um, I, I took the existential coaching book and I picked it up a bit in April it's coming out. Um, so if you wanted to so learn more about another book about coming existential out. coaching. Wow, um, another book coming out. That's amazing. I can make sure you send me a copy of that as well. <laughs> you can pre-order on Amazon. I will. 16th of April. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got direct contact here. <laughs> so which comes on nicely into discussing this episode's topic, which is about how to make big decisions, especially mm -hmm. on commitment, uh, marriage, kids, and even breakups. Mm -hmm. um, we always have, um, I always come across people that are umming and ahhing as to how to make these decisions. And there is a process, and there are philosophy, philosophers in the past that have done certain things to sort of like, um, that we still use up till today, because I was doing some research actually, right. and in July 1838, mm -hmm. Charles Darwin, then 29, sat down to make a very difficult decision. And it wasn't, it was going to alter his course of life and it wasn't anything to do with like, you know, a scientific question. It was, um, or the origins of species or whatever. It was about, it was kind of existential, very personal. And it was in the nature of, should he get married? <laughs> okay. And what he did was write down the pros and the cons and write a list, you know, uh, yeah. Quite the approach. Quite the approach, exactly. Which is actually when I was doing some research on how to make decisions, it does actually state that up till today that this is you know one of the best ways of sitting down because a lot of us only have things in our head that's why we go around in circles and we cannot even come to it but when you actually sit it down and write down the pros and cons and number it as to you know why is it like that not just list it okay and also as to why is you know being a bachelor continuously so good then you know being committed and what is all of these things so what are your thoughts about that 
art, to be honest, <laughs> on how to how Mr. Darwin well, did it. <laughs> well, I wish it was that simple. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure for Darwin it wasn't. Um, no, of course I know, not. I know lots of people and I've done that in the past myself. It's like sitting down, writing a list, pros, cons, and then the list of cons are so much more and you still want to do it. Exactly <laughs> and you're like, that. Wait a second, that didn't quite work. Exactly so that. I think it's useful to start thinking about stuff. And mm -hmm. as you say, like if you look into the whys and each of these points, it starts a conversation about why do you want to do this, why do you want to not want to What's do this. What's actually more important or not the priorities. However, the, yeah. the times, like it happens so often that you make that list and you, you still don't know what to do. Yeah. You know? Or and you're going after the one that doesn't look good. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's about something like marriage. Exactly. How many people feel they really shouldn't enter that relationship? It doesn't make any rational sense and they still do it because they're emotionally so drawn to it. Or continue in a relationship when it shouldn't really be exactly. continued. This is, a, this is objectively, I'm feeling so bad every day, but I still, I'm not leaving. You know, and the marriage thing I can very much relate because I'm getting married in exactly one month. Congratulations. Um, so I, I had a first-hand experience of that huge commitment because for me, a lot of people get nervous before they get married. Right. I got really nervous before I asked her to marry me. Okay. Because for me, it was very much about the commitment right. rather than yeah, that makes the sense. involvement of all of the other people. So I went through all of the motions about like what I'm committing myself to here. Yeah. Because like, existentially, every choice excludes other possibilities. And the big choices exclude vast amounts of other possibilities. I think everybody who gets married should at least have the intention to be married forever. Right. And, very true. Well, Depending on your view on marriage, that is, might not be so common anymore mm -hmm. because for some it's just yes, a signature it has and they can go yeah. different ways. Yeah. But also, if you invest so much in a, in a wedding, for example, it, it's not it, you don't just want to like end it a couple of months later exactly. when you've invested so much of yourself into it. Yeah, the whole idea of marriage is meant to be for life, mm -hmm. really. really you know, that's where it comes mm -hmm. from. Okay. Yeah. And then there's also the whole ceremony aspect around it that you commit publicly and that there's an element of shame if you went out of it. Yes. You know, so... These decisions are huge. Breakup is huge. You, like some people need to divide up friends or like, oh, you get yeah. yoga and I get the tennis club. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's, there's inconveniences in terms of how do you divide up your life. But uh, there's so many elements to it that the, existentially, it's the anxiety of missing out on other things. If you choose one person, you can't be with all the others anymore. That's true. You know, if, and, unless it's a non-traditional, non-monogamous yeah. relationship. Right. You know, that they are on the rise, you know, but like if you talk about monogamous relationships, which are still the norm. Of course. Um, you choose one person, you can't be with all you the others. At others. least not without risk. <laughs> yes, there's consequences for everything. <laughs> exactly. So that's why existentially every choice is difficult. And not just the big ones, the small ones. Some people despair over choosing lunch. Because, you know, if I have the pasta now, I can't have, have the meat or the sandwich later. anymore. Yeah. You know, I could okay. serve it later, but it's a different experience. Yeah. That's you know, so which true. kind of socks am I putting on in the morning? If it's the funky ones, I, I, might, uh, I might not get the job that I meet somebody and they're like, oh, this would be a perfect fit for our company. But actually with those kind of socks, I'm not sure if that will work out. But That's true. you might start a conversation with the love of your life and they say, funky socks, who are you? That's true, absolutely. Even the choice of which socks to put on can despair some people. No, that's very true and we don't maybe consider that. But as you were speaking also, what was really important, what you mentioned was how we live existentially, taking existentialism into consideration, is you um, knowing yourself and what you want. But a lot of us make choices with regards to how society expects us to behave and be and how it looks. And right. those drive our choices and decisions right. a lot of the time. And that's what's happening consistently. People are not being authentic mm -hmm. to themselves. Yeah, and it it's, can be difficult to be authentic. You know, um, Heidegger said we can only weave in and out of authentic, authentic states. It's not that we become authentic ones and then right. we stay like that. There's, like for example, uh, there, we have so many different facades, so many different masks, so many different identities. At work we show up differently than at mm -hmm. home. And in front of our friends we might make different decisions than in front of our partner. You know, we behave differently, we talk differently. But do you think that's like normal and that's mm -hmm. okay to Absolutely. be that way? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's inevitable to some right. degree. I don't think anybody is completely the same at work than when they're at home with their wife. Okay. You know, or at home but with it depends partner. how that comes across as well. Um, when you're saying that, like to me, the way in which people have described the fact that their partners are not the same with me is actually isn't a negative state. 
whereas they're better at work than they are with me. But if you just have differences where actually your partner can be a lot more, you know, empathetic and compassionate, then that's different. So be careful when you're having differences as to where those balances are and the negative and the positives are with each person as well. And what's coming out more? Is the negative coming out more at home or it's that positive coming out more? You know, that's what I'm sort of trying to get at because a lot of clients come to me because of the differences in you know the treatment with other people and they just say it's fake or it's not right only because that different facade is negative or positive mm -hmm. and I think that with certain people they are maybe comfortable at home but then the negativity is normal and it comes out more at what home meaning less empathetic less considerate less friendly mm -hmm. you know at home Whereas when you're at work or when you're with your friends, you make that effort, you make it work. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not your choice, you will show up smiling instead of complaining. Mm -hmm. You seem to sort of, you know, bring about yeah. a lot so more. I think this is where that comes in. Like we act, we, we behave to different standards when mm. we are at work and when we are at home. Some people, they, they let their guard down at home and they are more relaxed, they don't put so much work into it but anymore. people say that with friends as well, their guard is down with friends, they can be with their friends. So let's just take the work, the friends and the home. You know, there's couples that have come to me where, you know, they're like, I can't be with my wife anymore, I can't be with my husband, but I enjoy my friends even though I've had them even longer than my wife or my husband. So, like, what happens there? <laughs> I think when you're in a relationship and you see each other a lot, you're expected to put work into that relationship. Friends, you're not as committed to putting all the yeah. work in. Sometimes I don't see some of my friends for a long time because I don't have that kind of commitment to them. If I call some of my friends, if I don't call them for a couple of months, it's no big deal. When I call them, it's pure love. But what about if you see your but friends like all the time? Mm -hmm. What if you see all your friends all the time and that's all you crave and that's all you want and that's all you do and the wife, for example, is le left at home and you don't want to go home and you don't want to show that side of yourself, the fun side of yourself, but you're still in that relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are the things like I'm giving you real case studies here mm -hmm. because I want to open up this because this is consistent. Right. It's not just one person right. that's come to me with these issues. It's consistent and I feel like with long-term relationships, this is what happens mm -hmm. and I'm like trying to understand, you know, how do we show up, mm -hmm. you know, to be in a particular way, to maintain relationships with friendships as well as with your home um, in an equally balanced way. Yeah, so I think the key to that is to, is to talk, mm -hmm. is to find out what are our values, what do we want from this relationship, what, what are we both working towards, what is the driver and the fuel of this engine that we produce together. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in, those, in those times when you feel a bit alienated at home, or like when you feel more comfortable with your friends than at home, that's when you need to start having conversations with somebody or with yourself. You know, the coach helps you to have a conversation Absolutely. with yourself, really. Absolutely, yeah. Then you yeah. have a conversation with yourself. What's going on there? Yeah. Why am I not feeling comfortable at home? Yeah. What, what could I do so that becomes a comfortable space again? Yeah. Because you, I, I, like most of the time you would enter a relationship because it feels comfortable then. Yeah. I know there's different styles of relationship and sometimes people yeah. enter relationships for different reasons. Yes. But like, again, ask yourself, what is my motivation to be in this relationship? What is the purpose of it? Mm -hmm. And how can I make that work? Do we have the same goals, right. me and my partner? And then realize, well, okay, I want, I want what I want out of my relationship, but I also, presumably, you want to give your partner what she wants out of the relationship. And if these two things sometimes clash, you know, mm. I want to go out more and you want to stay at home more. Yeah. How do we reconcile that? Where can we make compromises? How can we find a solution? How, where's the common ground? You know, how can we figure yeah. this out? And over time I find also couples like one has got this growth mindset and they're continuously growing and developing whether they're constantly at work and the other one isn't. Mm -hmm. So then obviously it takes them even years to figure out that, wow, mm -hmm. you're like this and I didn't realize, but it's been yeah. happening over years. One of the key elements to a healthy relationship in my experience is that you the ability to grow together. Yeah. You know, not just to do things together, not just to do How nothing do you grow together. together? That's the thing. Well, first of all, you need to develop or have an appreciation that growth 
is inevitable and like it's not comfortable because growth always happens in a state of discomfort. Mm. Yeah. You know, when we change in the beginning, when we're young, we grow and it physically hurts. Yes. Later on, as adults, when we grow, we expand our mind. It's like, our mind. It's yeah. uncomfortable to grow. Yeah. And if there's somebody who likes us but likes us static, then it, it, there's gonna be problems yeah. inevitably because yeah. if I expect you to stay the same, same. person then this has it has to fail yeah that it's cannot it can only last for some time or if that same person remains the same and the other one wants them to develop and they yes. don't develop yes. again it's do, yes. it's doomed to failure so here's a key a commitment to growing together because mm. uh, some people have told me look there's a partner for a certain time yeah you know and I think these people probably have a, a mindset of they want to be with somebody and then when that person either changes to into something that they don't feel compatible with anymore right or they don't change but they don't change themselves mm. and then there's a mismatch yeah. and if you don't manage that change so that you can grow together then you grow apart absolutely absolutely but it takes constant talk intimacy talking communication to figure out where you what are you growing into what am i growing into so you make sure that you have this common overlap yeah. that you have yeah. this common ground that you have this thing that you have together like your haven or your roots and we're not saying to grow in the same direction are you saying we have to grow in the same direction by being like that or is just about having that understanding i don't think there's a direction necessarily with growth okay you know sometimes people grow apart because like yeah but like I think the most important thing is that you you know what what your core is, what your foundation is. That's the thing, yes. You know, and you're rooted in that foundation, mm -hmm. which could be values, which could be your kids, which could be like Any common, sort of belief. common beliefs, yeah. a certain vision of a life that you want to build. And then you can still grow arms, branches in different yeah. directions. You know, your partner might be doing, I don't know, something with a group of people that you know you don't understand and you yeah. have no interest in. And they can do that as long as they're rooted in your foundation, on your relationship foundation. Okay. You know, and sometimes if you feel you want to break out of that relationship foundation because you you lost the belief in that shared vision of yours, mm. in that life together in the future as two people who believe the same things. Sometimes your core beliefs change. Yeah. You know, sometimes you don't believe in fairness anymore or you don't believe in balanced relationships That's anymore. That's true. Yeah. And then at that point you grow apart and I think at that point it's so can be so painful to see that we lost our shared foundation and is that a deal breaker or can we recreate that or maybe it's time to let that go and let our, both of us be happy in the different directions that we're growing into so how do you make those big decisions with a lot of courage <laughs> okay give me something more give me something to explore right. deeper with that courage right so for example um, I'm working with a client um, who has after Four years of marriage, he's realized he's not going to be happy in this relationship and his wife will not be happy in this relationship. So it's a shared thing? He's married, well, we're not quite sure because he hasn't had that kind of conversation okay. yet. Okay, but he feels it. Yeah, yeah, we, we just we just started. Right. Um, and uh, it's a really, really difficult thing because he would need to let go of a lot. Yeah. It's comfort and it's safety and yeah. he, Familiarity. he really admires her, yeah. but he also knows that this is not going to work out in the future, but it's really difficult to cut that, cut that part out because what comes after is uncertainty. You're yeah. going to be single again. Yeah. You yeah. know, and you, it's difficult to be single again. We want comfort and safety and certainty. That's what existentially we long for of as course. people. Of course, yes. Naturally, we, we want comfort and safety. Mm -hmm. So if we are out on our own again, yeah, you know, it's a we whole feel new world. we do the right decision, but then also oh, we don't like to be alone. Yeah. And some people they choose to not be alone in a relationship that is a bit dysfunctional. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know the devil you know. Of course. You know, as of they course. say. Yeah. So how do you make the big decisions? I think there's a point in the coaching process when the realization is so strong. Um, that this is going to be better in the long run, even though it's harder in the short term. That's true. And then yeah. muster the courage to say, look, it's time, you know. And sometimes you just wait until you have that catalyst of like, yeah. now, now is the yeah, right time and you feel it. Or you say, look, rationally, this is the right choice. Pro and con, like Darwin yeah. might have yeah. said, like, yeah. quite rational. You'd say, 
look, I know this is not going to work out, and even though I'm still like anxious and I don't want to do it, and like I feel scared, I don't want to break up with that person, you know, and it's going to be so complicated. But I kind of, I know, I have accepted that this is the right decision, and then you just need to go and do it. And you have to accept the consequences for it too. There's a lot of consequences mm -hmm. around it, and I think. For each individual, those consequences are going to be different, you know, especially in relationships, if there's marriage, if there's years of investment, yeah. if there's, you know, outside influences that can break, if you have kids. make, of course, absolutely. And you need to consider those, but like, for example, with the kids particularly, um, I know some couples that stay together for the kids. Yes. The kids pick up yeah. on you absolutely. not being happy, on absolutely. you fighting. Absolutely. That's sometimes, what I was, yeah. sometimes it can be a lot more destructive for the kids if you stay together even though you don't want absolutely. to. Absolutely. Then if you have a healthy, separated life. Yes. And people don't get the fact that you can't live separate happily if you consider the children first. Mm -hmm. And a lot of I work with a lot of couples to do that. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, they use the excuse of, you know, staying together because of the kids. But yeah. what are you bringing yeah. to the children in that relationship? Yeah. And a lot of people stop thinking about the consequences mm. very early. Yeah. And this is why I think coaching is so valuable. Absolutely. It could also be a conversation with a friend, but a coach is trained to give you that kind of, open up that kind That's of conversation. Be like, okay, what, what would be? It's like, no, I can't, I can't, I can't. We have to stay together for the kids. Mm -hmm. And if you don't just accept that, but you say, tell, tell me about it, why, why can't it? You know? Exactly, exactly, and instead then, of just accepting. And then you help them think about it, okay, so, well, if I would do that, then that, and then what, and then that, and then what, and then that, and then in that process, often you realize, maybe it is an option. Yeah. Actually, now thinking about it, actually, maybe it's an even better option. Exactly. I remember getting coaching myself, and I thought I had certain things that I couldn't do or could do, but when you get deep into it, and when a coach really questions you, you know, without that biasness, without that direction, but just trying to figure you, make you figure you, it's yes. not even them, it's you figuring out yes. you and they're literally our catalyst to yes. do that. It is the most powerful and amazing thing because we don't get ourselves to that level mm -hmm. without a, that yes. real trained assistance. Yes. Funnily enough, it's so much easier to get into relationships than to get out of them. Why do you but, think? Well, because of the infatuation. <laughs> I think it's that and like, you know, uh, over time, you know, the investment and what is the commitment and yes. obviously, like you said, you get used to a natural habit, yes. right? Well, I say it's easy to get into relationships. I think it's easy to fall in love because you, you get infatuated, you, you get drawn because we're wired to be drawn yeah. to yeah. procreate. You of know, course, we're, of course. We're wired to connect with other people. To get into a relationship is that question of, well, are, are we going to make it official? Mm. Are we going to be yeah, that's the girlfriend, next big and one. boyfriend, 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 yeah. girlfriend, girlfriend, and girlfriend? Are we going yeah. to be together publicly? And mm. then the even more decision like, are we going to get married? Yes, the are we long term. Have children. Mm -hmm. You know, these are huge decisions, and it's helpful to think about what you're committing to, because it's it's both existentially. It's it's both. We hold this paradox. It's both a source of huge joy and vision and focus of meaning of purpose. You know, to to commit to a relationship and later children and a yes. life together that is so rich. But on the other hand, it opens a sea of anxiety because we make that choice. We cannot marry other people anymore. We cannot yeah. have kids elsewhere anymore. You know, so we're holding both of these. It's like huge source of meaning and purpose, but also scary because we're committing to something. That's why every commitment is wonderful and also anxiety provoking. Anxiety and also the fact that sometimes in a committed relationship or a long-term relationship, you know, it takes away a certain aspect of freedom, maybe, mm -hmm, and course. that individualism, and the fact that you have to make decisions and have that responsibility and have that consideration for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the kind of person you are to be able to even give that. And at the beginning, you, like I said, you'll be willing. Um, over time, it could be tiring. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Every commitment is tiring, yeah. but it's also so energizing. Yes. So since I committed to my relationship, I noticed these two things. It's given you that I, I drive? Was, yeah, in my 20s, I was, I call it dynamic drifting. Mm -hmm. I kind of knew where I wanted to be, but I right. didn't quite know how exactly that would look like. Mm -hmm. I, and I still went like, oh, this is nice. I'm going to do that. And oh, oh here's an opportunity yeah. and I'm going to say yes yeah. to. But like, generally, I was very happy, go lucky kind of guy, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and it was a wonderful sense of experiencing my existence, right. you know, because right. like, oh, it's smiley, oh, there's not really a worry because things are going to work out, you know, yeah. I have a pretty good direction. As soon as you commit to something, that changes because you're now on a path, yes. you know, and if you have a goal, then that also means you can fail. And that also means there's certain things you committed to making happen. Yes. So 
a huge focus and energy happened. It released so much. I've been working harder than any time, other, any other time in my in my life. Like it, it's been a fantastic, productive journey. At the same time, also the other day it was sunny, and I'm like, like ten years ago I used to just go to the park. Yeah, like, yeah. Eight years ago I was like, what am I gonna do today? Yeah, hmm. it's just about <laughs> you. And now it's like. I still have 18 things on my to-do list that I yeah. kind of really need to get done. Yeah, you're growing up. But also, <laughs> <laughs> but it's also amazing because like they're all really meaningful to me. Yeah. So I might have worked really hard, but I go to bed and I'm like, I'm doing the right thing here. Mm. And like sometimes I go to bed like early and I was like, what have I done today? <laughs> and it's it's both wonderful and meaningless. And at the other end, it's like both meaningful but also exhausting. Yeah. So it's not that one thing is better than the other. Like I, I think it's important that we respect what choices people make, how they want to go through life. Because I'm not saying choosing a life of meaning and purpose in a committed relationship is the way to go. You know, I, I deeply envy both people. Like when I was like somewhere in the middle, it's like they're both great ways. They're to both live. great ways. That's true. But they have different consequences. Yes. What I what I want is in my existential coaching work is. I want, I want my clients not to be in a position where they're facing the end of their life and they regret how they lived it. Exactly. You know? And that's an important thing that you can do through a conversation. It's like looking, imagine you're, you're on your deathbed or imagine there's your funeral. What do people say about you? Imagine you're approaching your 80th birthday and you look back. Mm. You know? Or imagine a doctor would tell you you've got six months to live. Right. You know, what would you regret doing or not doing? You know, and that can really create so much energy That's to make true. decisions that that are really. So you important create to that you. urgency. You know, get out of the relationship yeah. or get into, into the, the relationship. relationship. Tell her or him that you love them. Mm -hmm. You know, or tell somebody to bugger off. You know. It's good to think like that, but unfortunately, we don't have that sense of urgency come to us. Mm -hmm. We have to create that sense. We can sense create of, it. We can have to create it. But we don't like it. That's the thing. That's the thing. We don't want to. We don't like it, but we kind of yeah. need it. it. Like endings and death, the ultimate ending yeah. is an is such a good motivator to get stuff done that means something. Absolutely. At the same time, it's a scary concept. And we don't really want to think mm. about it. So again, we hold this existential paradox, that dilemma. Of, of course. needing it but not wanting it. <laughs> but it's such an interesting conversation. I know we, we haven't really answered as to how to make big decisions, but I think that it does come down to the individual. It does come down to you knowing yourself really well and accepting the different stages and phases and having that core foundation, right. you know, whether it comes from, like you said, values and beliefs and understanding that through life we have to take on things that we may not like and it's uncomfortable but it's okay because yeah. you know we can't stay stuck yeah. there is no growth because even as humans like you said you know and I remember in our classes you know we love this you know we can adapt easily so when we stay in a particular way and we achieve yeah. something we get bored as well yeah. so we need that yeah. you know but energy there's many different decision making processes mm -hmm. I think it's important to have an understanding that some decisions don't have a better or worse. Yeah. They don't have a right or wrong. They're just decisions. They're just but decisions. Essentially, you can never know what would have happened if you That's did the true. other thing. And people always think like, oh, I've wasted all this time and I have regret. Mm -hmm. I really don't feel yeah. that life's about any failure or regret. It's just about having yeah. a journey, yeah. learning from it. Yeah, because you might have you might leave the relationship and meet the love of your life. Exactly. Or you might leave the relationship and be depressed forever. Exactly. <laughs> you just don't know. You just don't know. That's why existentially trust the process. It's the courage yeah. to commit to a decision and live with the consequences. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's a very great way to sort of end this episode. Mm -hmm. And it's given us so much insight and <laughs> I have learned a lot. And to be honest, like I really, you know, really, really advise people to look at your books and take it on board, <laughs> seriously, because it really does open up your mind. Yeah. It really, really does. And, you know, go onto your website and get more information because I think it will really help everyone. And thank you so much for today. I really appreciate that. I think, you know, people are going to look at relationships and themselves a lot more better. And even about coaching. Mm -hmm. Coaching is very powerful and they need to have that awareness about it and you, you're not broken you don't need fixing it is just a way forward to get the best version of yourself thank you thank so you. much Yannick really a really wonderful it was my pleasure thank you so much for watching I hope you enjoyed the episode today and we will be back with more conversations and new guests on Coach Talk thank you goodbye